In the last video, we saw that this equation has a really nice algebraically derived solution. I just want to remind us of kind of how that whole thing worked. The first thing we did was compute the eigenvalues. In this case, there was only one eigenvalue. It happened to have algebraic multiplicity 2, geometric multiplicity 1. That means we could find one linearly independent eigenvector, namely 1, 3. Then we solved this other equation, a minus 3i, v2 equals v1. We found a v2 that satisfied that and used v1 and v2 to construct our solutions. They look like something times e to the 3t and then a linear polynomial times e to the 3t. The big question you might ask yourself is, uh, did we get lucky? Was that a fluke, an accident? The answer is no, but in order to describe it, we're going to need a little bit of algebraic terminology. And this is going to start from computing what does a minus 3i squared do to v2? Well, what does a minus 3i squared mean? Just a minus 3i times a minus 3i. And because v2 solves this equation a minus 3i v2 equals v1, we get a minus 3i times v1. Now, v1 was an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 3. So in fact, we get 0. The way to think of this is that a minus 3i doesn't kill v2. a minus 3i v2 gives you v1. That's not 0. But as long as you're willing to do a minus 3i enough times, you can kill v2. And that's really the key. We're going to give this sort of thing a name. We call v a lambda generalized eigenvector of order k. If there is some power, call that power k, of a minus lambda i that does in fact kill v, but if you took even one less power, if you go down to k minus 1, that didn't kill v. In this case, our v2 is a 3 generalized eigenvector, and its degree is 2. So what good are generalized eigenvectors? It turns out that just like for the non-defective case, we could find a basis of eigenvectors, for any matrix, we can find a basis of generalized eigenvectors. If you take a generalized eigenvector of order k, and you simply apply the matrix a minus lambda i to it, k minus 1 times, so you apply it once, write that down, apply it twice, write that down, etc., go all the way up to k minus 1, what you get is a list of generalized eigenvectors. If you apply a minus lambda i to v once, you reduce the order by 1. a minus lambda i to the k minus 1 to a minus lambda i of v, that's a total of k powers, and we know that because v had order k, that that answer is 0. And in fact, that's the smallest k that'll do. All right, so if we keep applying a minus lambda i all the way down the list, we get a bunch of generalized eigenvectors sort of in descending order, right? Each one has order 1 less uh, than the one to its right. I want to point something out about the very last one in the list, or I guess as we've written it left to right, the very first one in the list. It's an eigenvector. If you apply a minus lambda i to it, you get a total of a minus lambda i to the k times v, which we know is zero. Okay, so the first thing to realize is that this is a sort of natural sort of set of generalized eigenvectors to consider. You start with one of order k, you get ones of order k minus one, k minus two, k minus three, all the way down to um, at the very beginning, you get actually a genuine eigenvector. So what's the theorem here? It's that these, in fact, are all linearly independent. And if you count them up, how many do you get? You get k of them. Um, what's the problem with the defective matrix? You try to build a basis from eigenvectors. You don't have enough eigenvectors. The idea of generalized eigenvectors is that there always will be enough to produce a basis. This is a situation in which a very important principle in mathematics rears its head. Uh, this is known as Jagger's principle. You can't always get what you want But if you try sometimes well, you might find You get what you need I won't say the entire proof of Algebraic Theorem 1, but I will say one thing that you would need to check is that you actually do get enough vectors. Um, one step in that is to consider the situation where you have a particular eigenvalue, lambda, and you ask, okay, I'm going to look at all of the generalized eigenvectors for that eigenvalue. You can see from algebraic theorem one that once we've got one of them, the one with the biggest order is sort of in that chain, you know, we don't need the other ones, right? Or they sort of, you know, come along for free, if you like. So we're only going to focus on the ones that are sort of at the end of the chain, right? So I call those the maximal order generalized eigenvectors. Write all those orders down, like k1 through kl. If I add up all those orders, they have to add up to the algebraic multiplicity of lambda. 
And that's really the main step in the proof of this. So what's our goal in applying this linear algebra and thinking about generalized eigenvectors? It's ultimately to apply it to differential equations. So the application of the generalized eigenvectors, it lies in this theorem. So we're going to be dealing with this equation, x prime equals ax. Let's call the dimension of that matrix n. And you want to start with an eigenvalue whose algebraic multiplicity is m and whose geometric multiplicity is r. If r equaled m, which would sort of be the non-defective case, we're interested really when r is less than m. And the question is, how do we come up with m linearly independent solutions to this differential equation? We're going to start with a maximal order generalized eigenvector, which we'll call v upper one lower k1. Uh, k1 here will be the order of this generalized eigenvector. We apply the formula like we did in that example in the last video, except that because our generalized eigenvector has order k1, we're going to need k1 different solutions. So our polynomials will have order starting from zero and x1 all the way up to order k minus one. I want to make an observation here about these powers of t. Traditionally, we decorate them with one over the factorial of whatever degree we're dealing with. That should remind you of Taylor series. It's essentially just a convenience, but it ends up being a pretty convenient convenience. Okay, so the problem with this formula that we've written down for all these solutions uh, is that you can't apply it because you don't know what, I guess we know what VK1 is, but we don't know what the rest of them are. So here's how we get them. You get them by applying successive powers of A minus lambda I. Now, it's possible that having done this, we have gotten all that we needed. Maybe K1 happened to equal M and then we're done. If not, that means there's some other maximal order generalized eigenvector, call it v upper 2 sub k2, where k2 is the order of v upper 2 sub k2. Um, how do I know that eventually I'll get enough? Algebraic theorem 1 says that the solutions x1 through xk1, those are all linearly independent from, from each other. And algebraic theorem 2 says you can keep doing this and you will in fact eventually get enough solutions. That is to say, you will get m solutions handling that particular eigenspace. You do it again once for each eigenvalue, and you will end up with n total solutions. Okay, that sounds like a lot of stuff to try to remember, um, but the best way to do it is to do it in a couple of examples and get your feet out of you. Let's take this example, and uh, the first step in all of this is to find the eigenvalues. By computing the characteristic polynomial, we see that there are two eigenvalues, uh, lambda 1, which is 3, and what I'll call lambda 2 and lambda 3, which is 2. The algebraic multiplicities are pretty clear. What about the geometric multiplicities? Well, for lambda 1, because the algebraic multiplicity is 1, that's as small as it could possibly be, that's also the geometric multiplicity. Let's go ahead and find the eigenvector uh, that gives us this eigenspace. That one's not too hard. Um, you can see that if you do anything that doesn't involve the second or third columns, uh, you're going to get 0. So uh, let's take v1 upper 1 to be 1, 0, 0. Now let's do the other eigenvalue. So we compute a minus 2i, and we get this. There's no need to row reduce that. It's already in uh, row echelon form, and you can see its rank is 2, which means its nullity is 1. 3 minus 2 is 1. That tells us, of course, that this matrix is defective. So we're going to need a generalized eigenvector. So let's go ahead and compute the various powers of a minus 2i. There is a minus 2i squared, and it's not so hard to see that if you multiply a minus 2i times a minus 2i squared, on the one hand, you should get a minus 2i cubed. On the other hand, um, it doesn't change. So we see that all powers after 2 are actually the same matrix. What does that mean about generalized eigenvector? That means the greatest order of a generalized eigenvector uh, has to be 2. To be a generalized eigenvector of order 3, you know, the cube has to kill you, but the square can't. You can see the cube and the square are the same, so that can't happen. We're looking for something that a minus 2i squared kills, but that a minus 2i does not. And I think you can check that uh, it really doesn't matter what go in the second two slots. Any old thing going in the second two slots will do. As long as you have a zero in the first slot, this matrix is going to kill you. So we found uh, two vectors so far. You can see they're linearly independent, and we need to find one more vector so that we have a basis. The recipe we've learned says, well, you take this generalized eigenvector and you hit it with a minus 2i. You get 0, 1, 0. That's 3. We needed 3. We're done. Let's write down the solutions to this differential equation. The first solution comes from v11, just e to the 3t times v11. The other solutions correspond to the eigenvalue 2. There's our solution. You can check, in fact, that they 
give solutions, and that they are linearly independent.